Hello, everyone. I am Jo Guo from Morningstar Inc., and I have been working in the market data industry for almost 10 years. I'm honored to collaborate with XDRL International on this webinar series. In this session, I will aim to provide a data aggregator's perspective on how we use XDRL. The topics that we will look at today include a background on how a data aggregator uses reported financials and what is important to us. I will then outline the benefits of XDRL to data aggregators and to our end user clients. Next, I will touch on the challenges we face in utilizing and fully adopting XDRL. We will then end with some concluding remarks. So from a data aggregator's perspective, here is how we approach financial data collection. We start with the financial report provided by the company. We capture information as originally reported by these companies, as this is useful to the investors. So here you see a screenshot of the financial report by Exteron Holdings, Inc. And this is their 2012 um, fiscal year annual report. So we will actually capture this um, financial report as reported by the company. And we will then move to standardize the financials. So our goal here is to present financial information across different industries and markets in a comparable way to the extent that it is sensible to do so. So using the same example of Exteron Holdings, you can see that the company reported four different lines of cost of sales in their financial report. This level of granularity, while providing insight to the company's operations, is not as meaningful for comparison. Hence, what we do is that we standardize this to one Morningstar data item called the cost of revenue. And this will therefore allow Exteron's cost of revenue to be compared with the cost of revenue of other companies. Having looked at the financial reports processing briefly, this slide outlines the priorities from a data aggregator's perspective. So firstly, we focus on a manageable set of data points that can be used by our clients for all markets. Companies can provide um, a wide variety of items and descriptions. And if one starts to collect all the different variations of descriptions, that companies can have for a single accounting item, and you multiply that across different languages in different markets, one will end up with a very long list of variations just to describe one accounting item. Therefore, as a data aggregator, we want to help investors make sense of a large quantity of financial information. A single global tag allows for comparability across companies and markets. This facilitates stock screening and quantitative analysis. So we focus on a manageable set of data points that represent unique accounting concepts that can be used by our clients for all markets. Secondly, um, next we also want to provide an accurate um, and timely information for our clients. So these are two key measurements that investors assess the data aggregators by. Firstly, the accuracy or correctness of the data that we are providing. Wrong information will cause investors to make wrong decisions. This is therefore a very important criteria that we provide um, in accurate information to our clients. Secondly, we need to provide data in the timeliest fashion possible. Market data is very time sensitive, and we want the financial results of companies to reach the end user in the shortest amount of time possible. Next, we also want to collect data um, in an efficient and cost-effective way, and also provide these efficiencies and cost-effectiveness to our clients. So as a data aggregator, we collect financial information from different companies and different markets. This allows us to provide an efficient and cost-effective way for our clients to mine a large quantity of financial data. 
as a single global data source, it allows for easy export and data feeds into our clients' investment models. And another point with regards to this efficiency and cost effectiveness is that as with any business, data aggregators face rising costs and it's important for us to get a good return on our investment and operate in an efficient and cost effective way. We will next look at the benefits of using XBRL to the end user client. Firstly, XBRL provides a faster and more timely delivery of financial data. As shown in this screenshot uh, for both the US and Japanese market, XBRL filings are now released at the same time as PDF and HTML filings. So in the first screenshot, you can see that for US market, the interactive data um, icon shows the availability of XBRL um, filings. And in the second screenshot for the Japan market, you can see the PDF document in one column on the right and the XBRL document um, adjacent to it. So for these two markets, um, the timely filing of the XBRL financials coupled with the efficiencies that can be achieved by processing XBRL filings, will allow the financial data to reach clients in a shorter period of time. So this slide shows an estimate of the time taken to process um, XBRL filings. The first table compares our processing time of different types of filings um, across different markets in 2012. As you can see here, processing HTML filings in the US market takes approximately 20 minutes, and processing PDF documents in Canada, Hong Kong, and Singapore takes between 30 to 40 minutes. But processing XBRL in Taiwan takes only one to two minutes. It is evident that it is most efficient to process XBRL filings. Processing the XBR filings will allow more timely and faster delivery of financials compared to manual collection of PDF or automatic parsing of HTML and PDF documents. And every minute saved on the filing leads to significant savings across the whole market. So we did a comparison for the Taiwan market. In 2011, we processed HTML filings for the Taiwan market and it took us about eight minutes per filing. In 2012, when we used the XBRL filings, the time was reduced to one to two minutes per filing. This meant that we saved six minutes per filing um, for the Taiwan market when we used XBRL. Six minutes per filing may not sound too much, but when you extrapolate this across the entire market, we save about 727 working hours in a year, and this is very significant. Another benefit that XBRL provides to the end user client is that it provides more value added data. In the early stages of adoption, most regulators require filers to only provide the primary financial statements in XBRL and not the notes section. But over time, more regulators require companies to also provide their notes to financials in XBRL format. This means that we can process the value-added data more efficiently and provide them to the end user. A related benefit to providing more value-added data is that XBRL is able to provide this more granular data more efficiently as we can process it in a much shorter period of time. XBRL enables the delivery of more granular data um, in, a, in a shorter period of time. So, for example, if the XBRL te note tags are stable and fixed, and every company follows the standardized XBRL tag, data aggregators can easily match the XBRL name tags to the standardized template name tag according to a default mapping. So as you can see here, we have a custom tag called the US Gap Derivative Liabilities Current 
And if all companies tag that their, their current derivative liabilities consistently with this XVRL tag, this means that we can very easily provide this level of information to the clients by tagging this XVRL tag to the Morningstar standard tag derivative liabilities current. So this makes the information that used to be difficult to extract easily extracted and tagged. This enhances delivery timeliness, quality, and the granularity of as reported gap disclosures that we can make available to clients for all companies listed within a market. Fourthly, SQRL also facilitates a market-based taxonomy and this provides more comparable financial items across companies in the market. So for example, you can find different variations of cost of goods sold descriptions in HTML filings. On the left side of this table, you could see six different descriptions um, that could be found in HTML documents. But with the XBRL standardized tag, if companies use this tag consistently, they'll all be tagged with one single cost of goods sold XBRL tag. This unifies the descriptions of the accounting concepts and hence their structure and meaning across different companies within the market. So having looked at the benefits of using XBRL for the end users, we'll next look at some challenges in utilizing XBRL. Firstly, as a data aggregator, we need to incur significant infrastructure and switching costs. We have invested a lot in existing technology and intelligence to make them process HTML and PDF documents into the database efficiently. Having to do um, to switch from HTML and PDF processing to XBRL processing will mean additional costs will have to be incurred. For example, the current processes have been set up to parse tables efficiently, but with XBRL, we will need to gain additional technical know-hows to read and parse dimensional data in XBRL. Secondly, there are also certain timeliness issues for mutual fund data. As the examples below show, for certain mutual fund prospectuses or supplemental documents, the XBRL documents are released later than the first document that was made available to the market. So that once again, the interactive data icon shows that this is an XBRL document. So in this first company, 497 is the name of the filing. We see that the first document was first released on the 12th of December, 2012. However, the interactive data is only available on January 3rd, 2013. That is a delay in 22 days. In the second document, uh, in the second company, we're looking at the document 485 POS. So the first document was released on December 19, 2012. The XBRL data is only available on January 3rd, 2013. There is a delay in 20 days. This delay in timeliness makes the XBRL document less relevant since we want to process the first document when it was released. We also encounter challenges with regards to taxonomy especially in markets where the regulators allow tax open taxonomies without any regulation on the company-specific taxonomies. For the Japan market, there are about 5,000 elements in the standardized XBRL taxonomy, and another approximately 55,000 company-specific extensions to date cumulatively. There may be very good reasons for companies to do so, um, in providing the company specific extensions as they want to provide insight into their financials. But it understandably creates significant challenges when trying to line up the comparable items across companies and industries. The company specific extensions make automatic processing of the XPRL tags more challenging. 
efforts to automatically process the unique company-specific extensions will add to the technology cost with limited improvements as eventually we would still need an analyst to manually evaluate and tag the item. Another challenge um, that we face is also the differences in the export industries across different markets. We can see here in the U.S. we have seven different export industries, or in Japan there are 23 export industries. So it makes it difficult for us to standardize the different XGL industries across different markets. Another, we, um, another challenge we face are uh, market and data specific. So as discussed earlier, open taxonomies make the XPRL taxonomy less manageable. When there are too many company specific extensions, like in Japan, it is just not very easy to map more than 60,000 XPRL elements. Also, with the gap changes across the different markets, there's usually a significant change in the XPRL taxonomy structure as well. This significant change requires a lot of rework on our side to rehaul the mapping that we have done according to the older XPRL gap taxonomy. Also, there's in some markets, there's no easily downloadable format of the XPRL taxonomy. This makes it a challenge for us to be downloading it and doing the mapping on it for our own um, data aggregator's perspective. And we also face certain data quality issues. As you can see from this screenshot, the 0000 or 0000 description is meaningless to us and does not tell us what the item is and what we can tag it to. So these data quality issues make it difficult for us to be auditing um, the XBRL documents since it was supposed to be processed automatically. Another challenge that we have is with regards to handling nouns and zeros. Um, as a data aggregator, these do mean very different things. Um, for us. So zero is a reported value by a company and it represents that it was reported as zero, whereas a now just means that it was not reported by a company and it is silent. So we do try to make a firm distinction between these two items. But in XBRL, we can see that in this Taiwanese company, as shown by the red box, the company did not report any diluted EPS in the current year. So this would have been construed as a now if we had collected this information um, with an analyst. However, with the XBRL filing, it was construed as a zero, and so this is a different piece of information that we're assuming that the company made, that it, it reported zero value to EPS, which is not true. So this handling of the nouns and zeros um, do create some discrepancies in our policies when we're using XBRL. So, and when one accumulates all the challenges that we face in all the different markets, it is difficult for us to gather sufficient market expertise in XBRL processing for all the differences and challenges. So, in, in conclusion, um, from a data aggregator and our client's perspective, XBRL does represent a wealth of potential because there is much um, opportunities for collaboration between the different market players. And there's a lot um, of promise in the XBRL taxonomies and filings in terms of all the benefits that we saw earlier, more timely, faster delivery, more granularity, there is a lot of potential that XPR can bring to the end user. And this, so this is um, just something very attractive for data aggregators um, as well as our clients. As mentioned earlier, there's also a lot of opportunities for collaboration be it between XPR International and other market players like data aggregators or between data aggregators and software firms. This leads to new value propositions for the market, and everyone wins. 
there are chances to share technical and taxonomy expertise across um, the different companies and different uh, market players. And this can lead to improved products and experiences for the end user clients. And at the end of the day, the end user investor also wins. As you can see from the challenges outlined earlier, there are lots of possibilities for continuous improvements as well, uh, not only on the data preparer side or the XDR organization side or even the data aggregator's perspective. There's a lot of room for continuously improving how we handle and process and parse this XDRL data. And with the XDRL um, taxonomy and technology, it also represents possibilities for consistent adoption and implementation globally. Although we do see some market-specific challenges, but we do see a greater potential when all the different markets do use XDRL. There are certain efficiencies that can be achieved when they all implement this um, technology globally. But last but not least, um, the final note to make is that um, XDRL has been around in the market for some time now, and it is definitely gaining traction over the years. And although there's still room for um, continuous improvements and a wealth of potential that we can look forward to, we need to be realistic and expect evolution rather than revolution. It's just going to take time for everyone um, to um, get used to XDRL and have it at a stage where it's ready for global implementation and adoption. And with that, I thank you.